Well, good morning, Soundside Church, and those of you who are joining us from other places, we welcome you. Thank you for joining us today on either Facebook or YouTube or however you found us. And I would invite you right now to take your Bible and open it up to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Well, have you ever had an idea that you just wished you could share with everyone? Have you ever thought, man, if only people could just think like this, everything will be different. Have you ever wished you could just get people to think a certain way? Well, almost a century ago, a master orator and a skilled student of rhetoric laid out some general principles for getting your message across. Here's what he said. He said, Always make your appeal to the masses. That is, talk to the average person, not to the educated scholars. Make sure that you target their emotions, not their intellect. Target their emotions, such as fear or greed or hope or desire. Appeal to those emotions. Make sure you keep your message simple. Don't have multiple points. Emphasize one main point. And he actually said this. This was, the, this was his quote. The intelligence of the masses may be very small, but their power of forgetting is enormous. So just emphasize that one main point. When you're talking, though, don't give any credit to those who might disagree with you. Only talk about why your idea is the right one. You're not trying to be fair or objective. You're simply trying to present your idea. And then lastly, make sure that you repeat your message over and over. You will not persuade with argument, but through persistence. You say, well, that's it? Well, will that work? <laughs> it did work. In fact, it worked so well that this man's government banned him from speaking publicly for over two years. Of course, when the ban was lifted, he did return to the stage and he was able to persuade millions of Germans to follow him. His name was Adolf Hitler. Now, that was nothing new, of course, not in the 20s, not in the 30s, not in the 40s, nothing new at all. In fact, uh, tyrants and would-be dictators have been using techniques of propaganda and crowd manipulation ever since the beginning. And so it should come as no surprise to us to find that such a powerful tool should find its way into the church. Today we are finishing our series of messages that we have been calling Broken Tools. We've been looking from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, unto 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 6 today, as we have been going through the letter to the Corinthians, this second letter to the Corinthians. The theme of this letter, the overall theme, is my weakness, God's strength. And to help emphasize this theme, we've looked at a little section here that talks about some tools that we want to use that use our strength, not our weakness, but we find out that ultimately they are broken tools, broken tools. And today, the final broken tool we're going to look at is the broken tool of manipulation. We've looked at marketing, we've looked at metrics, we've looked at maps and models, and today we're looking at the broken tool number four, manipulation. We're going to find that tool at work in our text for today, and our message from today's text is going to be very, very simple. We're going to ask, what is manipulation? Why doesn't it work in the church? And what should we do about it? That's simple, isn't it? And it's that last part that we're going to be aiming at. What should we do about it? You see, I want to help you guard against being manipulated, but I also want to show you a better tool to use in your relationships with others. So if you've got 2 Corinthians chapter 4, let's go ahead and read verses 1 through 6. I'll read here. You follow along with your copy of God's Word. Here's what the Bible says. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers 
to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Once again, just a little background to understand what's going on here in these verses. The Apostle Paul, the founder there of the church there in Corinth, is off on his various missionary journeys, planting churches in other cities throughout the old Roman Empire. And in his absence, some teachers have come to Corinth and they have insinuated themselves into the life of the Corinthian church. And unfortunately, they are beginning to gain a following and take people not just away from Paul, but away from the message of Christ that he proclaimed and that he taught there. And so what he's been doing is he's been trying to show the Corinthian church uh, what his ministry is all about, what he's been teaching them, why they are being threatened by the, the teaching and the teachers that they're beginning to listen to. And today, Paul is just kind of contrasting what he does with what these teachers do. And he's basically saying, guess what? This isn't how I work but it is how others are working on you. In essence, what Paul sets out to do in the verses that we just read is to answer our questions. What is manipulation? Why doesn't it actually work in the church? And what should we do about it? So let's go ahead. Let's ask the first question. What is manipulation? Or rather, what is manipulation as we're considering it here in these verses? Well, I would direct you back to the first two verses, okay? Paul talks about having received a ministry by the mercy of God. We looked at this in previous weeks to show how Paul is a minister of the new covenant, a new agreement where God fulfills all the requirements for righteousness and all the blessings that he wants to give his people and just calls on his people to trust him. And that's Paul's ministry. That's what he's doing. And then he says, we're not going to be discouraged. Uh, it doesn't matter what people think of us or think of the message. We're not going to be discouraged. We completely turn away from disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning, and we refuse to tamper with God's word. Now, it's that phrase right there that I just said to you, tamper with God's word, that I want you to focus on for just a moment. What does it mean to tamper with God's word. Well, the word itself can mean to falsify, uh, to adulterate. That's kind of a, a weird word, but it just, it has the idea of mingling it with elements that don't belong to it. Um, but what I find most intriguing is that the word Paul used for tamper actually originated from another word for bait. That's right, bait. <laughs> like what you would use to catch a fish. That's where this word is coming from. And it got me thinking about the ways that we use bait. Now, I'm not a great fisherman, and I don't fish all that often, but when I do fish, I love to fly fish, okay? It's a very particular form of fishing that lends itself to a type of purism and snobbery, which I don't know why I enjoy that so much, but it works, and it's a great hobby. I really do enjoy fly fishing. Now, here's a little difference between fly fishing and other types of fishing. Now, when my dad and granddad taught me to fish uh, the first time, um, what we used were earthworms or night crawlers, as some people would call them. And, and maybe that's how you learn to fish, too. You have the fish hook and you thread the worm onto the fish hook. You cover up the hook and put the worm on it and you throw it out there. Maybe there's a little bobber that floats on top of the water and the fish starts eating the worm and the bobber starts going up and down. And you set the hook, reel the fish in. Hopefully that's the way it works. Now, here's the thing. No fish in his right mind would ever expect an earthworm to be floating in the middle of a lake. I don't know that fish have minds. I don't know what they think or what they expect. But the point is, for most fish, an earthworm is not part of their regular diet, okay? Because worms don't swim. <laughs> they don't live in lakes and rivers. They are earthworms, not lake worms. And so for a fish to eat a worm, well, that's not exactly his natural preferred food. Fly fishing, on the other hand, is a completely different hobby. Because in fly fishing, what you attempt to do is you attempt to recreate the fish's natural food. 
artificially, of course, made out of thread and feathers and bits of plastic. The idea is to create something that exactly, uh, exactly corresponds to what the fish would normally want to eat. And the idea is in the midst of all the things that the fish is normally eating, there's your fly, that's what we call it. It might be a nymph, it might be a dry fly, there's different names for it, it might be a streamer, okay? But the idea is that it is acting like the fish's natural food. Uh, the most fun type of fly fishing to me is to use that dry fly. You fling it out there on the water and it falls down the water like a, like a, 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 a just a, a feather really. And it looks like a bug has landed on the water. And the fish thinks it's a bug that has landed on the water. And since the fish wants to eat the bugs, it eats your fly and voila, you've caught it. Um, of course, you have to figure out what the fish is hungry for. You can't just throw any fly out there. Yeah, if the fish is eating mayflies, you need to have a fly that looks like a mayfly. That's the way fly fishing works. You want to mimic the natural food that it's already eating in order to trick it into eating something else, namely a fish hook. Now, that is the idea here. We're not necessarily putting bait on a hook. When we manipulate the message, tamper with the word of God, sometimes it looks a lot like fly fishing, mimicking the natural food. And let me explain what I'm talking about, because manipulation can take two forms here. In the one form, you can manipulate the message. In the other form, you can manipulate the audience. I'm going to talk about both of those here for just a second. When we manipulate the message, okay, manipulate the message of God's word, manipulate the gospel, the gospel is actually the fish hook. But we use something else as bait to dress it up. That's how we tamper with it. We want people to eat the gospel, okay? But we're going to cover it up and make it look like something else so that when they eat what they think they're getting, they're also going to get the gospel, all right? And the Bible calls that tampering. That's manipulation. It's not a good thing, okay? But we, here's how we do it. We use things to dress up the gospel because we think people aren't going to want the gospel any more than a fish is just going to want a fish hook, all right? People aren't going to want the gospel, so we have, to, we have to cover it up. We have to make it look like something that they want, Okay, and so, or maybe we just have to make it not look like something that they don't want. And so we have different ways of doing this. So one way that we like to do this is we recognize that uh, the Bible is very clear on what it teaches about gender and sexuality. And we realize that that really runs counter to the culture. And maybe people will never believe in Jesus if, if, we, if we are honest about what the Bible says about gender and sexuality. So let's cover it up. Let's deny what the Bible says about gender and sexuality. Let's change what the Bible says about gender and sexuality. Let's just ignore it and not talk about it. We've got to cover that up, okay? We just want them to get Jesus. Forget all this other stuff. And one of the ways that we manipulate the message is by changing it, by denying it, by ignoring it. Uh, sometimes, sometimes what we do is we try to cover up the gospel with, uh, by linking the Bible to a particular political platform. People are very passionate about their politics. Uh, people are very passionate about social issues. And so what we try to do is we try to figure out what are they passionate about. And we link Christianity to a particular political platform or a particular political position because they're going to get passionate about politics. And boy, if Christianity is right there, maybe they'll get some Jesus along with it. We tamper with the message uh, when we link Christianity with politics. We tamper with the message when we link Christianity uh, with progressive issues. But quite honestly, sometimes it's not political at all. Sometimes we tamper with the message just by creating this message of self-affirmation, uh, telling people, hey, look, you know what? God loves you just the way you are. All you need is just a little Jesus. You're fine the way you are. In fact, you're a superhero. You just need a little Jesus added on top of your awesomeness. All right. And in those cases, what we're doing is we're, again, we're just giving people what we think they want, the kind of stuff that they feed on all the time. And we're just hiding a little Jesus in there. Maybe they'll take the Jesus. Maybe they'll take the gospel with the message of self-affirmation. Of course, that message of self-affirmation leads to the other type of manipulation, manipulating the audience. Okay. When we manipulate the message, the gospel is the hook and we got to dress it up or cover it up. When we manipulate the audience, However, the gospel becomes the bait. Something else is the hook. 
and that something else is what we really want them to get. That starts to sound a little sinister, but it does happen. The gospel is the bait. The hook is something else. This is the tactic of the prosperity gospel. Okay, the prosperity gospel. Uh, and there are prosperity teachers galore. They tend to have huge followings, huge buildings, huge mansions, huge private jets, because what they do is they use just enough Bible and Jesus to make religious people think they're getting the real thing, but then they get hooked by the promise of health and wealth. That's how the prosperity gospel works. The gospel's the bait. And many, 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 many Christians or professing Christians have been hooked by a false gospel because it looked just enough like the real thing that by the time they'd swallowed it, they didn't realize that they're being taken for a ride. Well, which of these were the Corinthian teachers doing? Were they manipulating the message that is uh, giving people what they think they want in hopes that they'll take the gospel? Or are they using the gospel to cover up what they really want the people to get? Are they manipulating the message or manipulating the audience? And and truth is, I'm not sure. I'm really not sure. Um, uh, Second Corinthians doesn't necessarily tell us enough about what they were doing, and perhaps it was a little bit of both. Regardless, they tried to win the church to their teaching, and by winning, uh, they tried to win the church to their teaching by winning the church to themselves, and at that same time, they tried to win themselves a following by winning people to their teaching. And in both cases, their manipulation resulted in a win for them personally. What Paul says is, I don't care what you think of me. Here's the truth. I don't care what you think of me. Here's the truth. Did you, did you see what he said? He said that we would commend ourselves to everybody's conscience through an open statement of the truth. You like me? I don't care. Don't like me? I don't care. Here's the truth. If you accept my message, you'll accept me. If you don't accept my message, you won't accept me. Wow. That takes a lot of courage, doesn't it? Some people would say, well, maybe if they'll like me, they'll like my message. If they don't like me, they won't like my message. Paul says, no, 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 you've got it backwards. That's how to manipulate people. Uh, If you like my message, you'll like me. If you don't like my message, you won't like me. And I'm fine with that. I just want you to hear the message. Now, Soundside Church, let me just give you a direct message from me right now. And that is this. You know, we have got to be so careful that we are not doing this, okay? Uh, We are actively serving in our community, serving in the schools, serving with the parks. That's part of our mission. We say that we're here to engage others with the love of Christ, that they might experience new life in Christ. But let's not make the mistake of saying we're trying to serve our community so that they'll like us, and maybe if they like us, then they'll like Jesus. <laughs> Let's make sure we're not doing that. Um, are we more concerned with what people think of us or with what they think of Jesus? Because if we're more concerned with what they think of us, then we may very well be guilty of using this broken tool. And we don't want to use this broken tool because it doesn't work. It doesn't work, not for what we want it to do. So let's go ahead and ask that. We've asked, what is this manipulation? Let's go ahead and ask, why doesn't it work? Why doesn't manipulation work? All right, well, verses three through four tell us that. Uh, It says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Uh, And in their case, those who are perishing, uh, the God of this world, that is a reference to the devil, not God, okay? The God of this world, this age, uh, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Now, here's what Paul just explained. Paul just explained here that if people do not believe the message of the gospel, it's not because he's been holding back. If people do not believe the message of the gospel, it's not because he has failed to manipulate them, okay? Uh, If people do not believe the message of the gospel, the problem is with them. Uh, not the gospel and not the gospel messenger. The problem is with them. It's with the veil that lies over their heart. He discussed that uh, in chapter three that we looked at last week. But the problem actually goes deeper than just the veil that lies over the hearts of unbelievers. Uh, The problem is that the God of this world has blinded them. He doesn't want them to see. So what's the reason that manipulation doesn't work? Manipulation doesn't work because it's not strong enough. Manipulation does not work because it's not strong enough. It is not powerful enough to break through the veil and give sight to the blind. You cannot manipulate people that far. Okay, let's go back to the fishing illustration illustration for just a second. 
In the state of Washington, we have many rivers and many fish. Lots of great places to go fishing. In fact, we've got some really cool species of fish that are fun to catch. Salmon, steelhead, trout. Great fun. But there are large sections of our rivers here in the state of Washington that are fly fishing only. But in those fly fishing only areas, a lot of them are catch and release. That is, we're trying to protect the population of the steelhead, the trout, the salmon. Um, and because they're catch and release, these areas require what are called barbless hooks. So what's a barbless hook? Well, a normal fish hook, it's a, you know, a J shape, and then it's got a little spike coming back. It's a barb, right? So the, once the, the hook goes into the flesh, that barb hooks on, and you can't, pull the, the, you can't pull the hook out. In fact, it's very difficult to get the fish hook out of the fish's mouth, and the fish certainly can't do it. Well, barbless hooks... Uh, do less damage to the fish, obviously, when you have to unhook them and throw them back, but it also makes it a heck of a lot easier for the fish to spit the hook out. You see, in fly fishing, what we try to do is give the fish something that looks like his natural food, but once he bites on it and sense th senses that hook, he wants to spit it out. With barbless hooks, he can spit it out. Now, when it comes to the gospel and giving people and trying to manipulate the message, the thing is this, when somebody who doesn't receive the message of the gospel senses it, they sense it's not what they think they've been biting on, and guess what? They're going to want to spit it out. I want the message of self-affirmation. I want the confirmation bias of my politics. What's this other thing you're trying to give me? Blech, I don't want that. Here's what the Bible teaches us. We cannot give supernatural things to natural people. We can't give supernatural things to natural people. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, Paul had already written to the church. He says this, The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. He is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. We cannot give supernatural things to natural people. That's why manipulation doesn't work. It cannot pierce the veil. It cannot give sight to the blind. Look, manipulation, you can attract crowds, you can generate donations, you can build large platforms, and you can build organizations that give every appearance of being a church just by manipulating the message or manipulating the audience. But unless the gospel actually takes root in people's hearts, it will leave them unchanged. That's why the devil says, I don't want you to see this. I'll do anything I can to keep you from seeing this. Why? Because the gospel is powerful enough to give sight to the blind. Our manipulation and propaganda can't do it, but the gospel itself has the power to give sight to the blind. And so the devil does everything he can to keep people's eyes covered. And one of his most effective techniques is to keep people's eyes covered by convincing Christians that the gospel isn't powerful enough on its own. It needs a little help from us. And so we start covering it up. Church, listen to me. When we rely upon manipulation to win people, when we think we have to cover up the gospel in order to win people, in order to give it to people, we are inadvertently doing the devil's work for him. So what should we do instead? We've asked, what is manipulation? We talked about manipulating the message, manipulating the people. We've said, why doesn't manipulation work? It's just not powerful enough to do what it needs to do. So what are we going to do about it? Well, verses 5 and 6 give us some direction. Here's what Paul wrote. Um, give me just a second to go back, find our passage here. Here's what he writes. What we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord with ourselves as servants for Jesus' sake, as your servants, excuse me, for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Paul tells us here that the role of the Christian minister, the role of the Christian teacher, is to help people see Christ because he himself has seen Christ. And if we feel like we need to rely upon the broken tools of marketing, metrics, maps, models, manipulation to do God's work, we should rightly ask the question if we've actually encountered Jesus ourselves. I'm going to say that one more time, can I? Okay. The role of the Christian minister, or the Christian in general, is to help people see Christ because we've seen him. And no, I don't mean seen him in the flesh. That's not what I mean, okay? I mean perceived him, witnessed his life-transforming power in ourselves, okay? 
Uh, we want people to see Christ because we've seen him. And if we think we've got to rely upon marketing, metrics, maps, models, and manipulation to do God's work, I think the question is fairly asked, have we even seen him ourselves? Paul experienced Jesus. Have you? Have you experienced Christ's life-transforming power? Because if you haven't, it makes total sense that we would use the broken tools of this age to try to win people to a religious movement. But if we have experienced Christ's transforming power in our hearts, we have to recognize it was the power of God and the grace of God and nothing we can create or manipulate can ever hold a candle to that. It must be him that draws people. It must be him that changes people. It must be him that saves people. And so what do we do about it? Two recommendations here as we close. Number one, test the message. This is where I want to help you uh, keep from being manipulated, okay? Test the message, okay? What is the gospel? All right, the word gospel just means good news. It's good news, right? What is the gospel? The gospel is an announcement, all right? It's not a program, it's not a 12, you know, it's not steps. It's not instructions. The gospel is an announcement. What is it an announcement of, Aaron? It is an announcement that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be our savior, to live a righteous life that we couldn't live, to go to the cross and suffer the judgment for our sin and to rise again from the dead to defeat death so that he can give eternal life freely to all those who repent of their sin and trust him as their Lord and Savior, okay? The announcement is that God has done it. The announcement is that Jesus Christ has finished all the work necessary, all right? The gospel is an announcement, and just like any announcement, this announcement will evoke a response from the people who hear it. Some people will hear it and it will evoke a response of indifference and they will just choose to remain, uh, choose to ignore it. For others, it will evoke a response of repulsion. They don't like it and they are going to retaliate against it, try to silence it. And for others, it will evoke a response of glad acceptance and adjustment of my life to be in line with that announcement. It's just like the announcement about, we just had, you know, a little while ago about you don't have to wear masks anymore. <laughs> yes. Oh, I was so glad to hear that. But the announcement that we don't have to wear masks anymore, um, it evoked a different kind of response. <laughs> Some of you haven't been wearing masks all along. You've really just kind of been resisting it. So you heard there's no mask mandate anymore. And you were like, I don't care. I've never been following it anyway. And you just kind of ignore it. All right. Others of you, uh, you're still wearing a mask, even though uh, the, even though those responsible have said we don't need to anymore because of the information you're leaning on. And you heard no mask mandate, and it prompted a response of fear and anger and repulsion. And you've wanted to kind of fight back and say, no, 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 we need to still be wearing masks. I'm, this doesn't make me feel good. Others of you, and I count myself among them, heard no mask mandate, and I met that announcement with glad acceptance, and I have adjusted my life to not wear a mask anymore. Hmm. It's an announcement. The gospel is an announcement. And so I want you to test the message. Test the message, okay? Does the message exalt Christ or exalt you? All right. Does it exalt Christ by telling us everything that he has done? Or does it exalt you by telling you all the things you need to do? All right. Test the message. Does the message exalt Christ? Does the message call for repentance? Okay. Uh, the good news means that we've been living under a sentence of bad news. All right. So does it call for repentance? That is turning away from the life I was living. All right. Now this could this could call about this this could refer to you converting to faith in Jesus Christ or it could even refer to Christians we believe in Jesus but my life's gotten off track and I'm hearing this message and I need to turn from the sin I've been practicing to come back to following Jesus. All right? Does it call for repentance or does it just tell you you're okay the way you are? Um Jesus didn't die to leave us the way we are. He died to renew uh the image of God in us. Okay? Um 
does, does the message make you uncomfortable? And once again, this kind of hinges on the repentance thing. And the idea is that unless you think that you are totally perfect, then something in us has to change. Uh, we are in a long journey of progressive change to look more and more like Jesus Christ, and that demands daily change. That's not an insult to us, okay? God does love us uh, more than we can possibly imagine. We are created in the image of God, but the fact of the matter is uh, there's still a lot of work to do, and it's work that we can't do by our own strength. It's work that God wants to do in us, and so we gladly submit to him continuing to transform us, all right? The caterpillar can't be satisfied with the way he is when his destiny is to become a butterfly. I'm not satisfied with the way I am because I'm destined to be conformed to the image of Jesus, and so the message of God's word should make me feel uncomfortable because I'm not where I need to be. I'm not saying that you, that, that, you know, a sign of the good news is you feel really bad. Okay, I'm not saying that at all. A sign of the good news is that you understand that things can be better and Jesus wants to take you there. All right, so does it make you uncomfortable? Does it make you uncomfortable in the realm of sexual ethics? Okay, uh, if you practice the sexual ethics of this age, the gospel of Jesus should make you feel very uncomfortable. Um, does it make you feel uncomfortable because God calls you to restrict your personal liberties for the good of others. That is part of following Jesus. Jesus literally left heaven to come down here for you. All right? He literally uh, laid aside the exercise of his divine attributes in order to save us. Okay? And he calls upon us to set aside our personal liberties from time to time in order to serve others. But that's going to make some of you feel very, very uncomfortable because it means you're acting more like Jesus. Uh, and then, then uh, you know, I just throw something else out here, you know, make you feel uncomfortable in caring for the poor, make you feel uncomfortable in welcoming extravagant sinners like junkies and prostitutes. Uh, following Jesus is going to make us feel uncomfortable because none of us are perfectly like him. And getting closer to him is going to mean change. Test the message. Does it exalt Christ? Does it call for repentance? Does it make you feel uncomfortable as you get closer to him? Test the message. Finally, finally, trust the message trust the message. Paul said, I know what it did for me, and I know it can do this for you. So trust the message. He wrote in another place, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. See, how is a person saved? What does God do to, what, what do I have to do? What does God do? He's already done it, and now there's an announcement that it's been done, and the announcement carries with it the power to change people's hearts so that they believe it. The announcement carries with it the power to open blind eyes so people can see it. Trust the message. You don't need to change it. You don't need to manipulate it. Just trust the message. Trust the message for yourself trust the message for others. Trust your message trust the message for yourself. I want you to hear what Paul said over in 2nd 2 2nd 2 Timothy um, chapter 4 verses 3 through 4. Here's a warning here. He says this. He says, "Look, uh, the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. They will turn away from listening to the truth and they will wander off into myths. Trust the message to be enough for you." Okay, don't don't have itching ears. Don't 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 accumulate teachers who just tell you what you've already decided to believe and what you already want to hear. Read through the Bible. There's there's not a part of the Bible that's not for you in some way, form, or fashion. Receive the Bible. Okay, receive the Bible. Don't be a consumer. Receive the Bible. Understand that where wherever the Bible is opened or whatever is being preached on, as long as it's the Bible, God has that for you. Don't manipulate the message by demanding that it interest you. Don't manipulate the message by demanding that the messenger show you how it's relevant to your life before you're willing to listen. It's like the it's like the the the, the comic that I saw one time. There's a bunch of kids in math class in algebra, you know, studying algebra, and one student says, "Teacher, are we ever going to use this stuff?" And the teacher says, "Well, you won't, but maybe some of the smart kids will." That may be rude. I'm sorry. The point is that many of us demand to see the relevance of something before we put the effort into learning it or put the effort into listening to it. But here's the truth. If you waited to see a need for something before taking the time to learn it, you would go through life completely unprepared for the challenges that you will meet. 
And that's why God invites us to read all of his word. That's why God commands preachers and teachers to preach and teach the whole counsel of God. Uh, we have, we've taught through, we like to teach through books of the Bible. It doesn't mean that we can't choose topics from time to time to, to, to meet a pressing need, uh, but it does mean that our regular diet should just be opening this book and seeing what God has to say. Maybe it doesn't matter for what I'm going through today, but maybe God wants to tell me something today, so I'll be ready tomorrow. Trust the message for yourself. Trust the message for others, all right? Christ doesn't need to be dressed up, and neither do you. Neither do you. Don't uh, trust the message. Don't feel like you need to manipulate the message by presenting yourself to someone else as other than as something other than you are in order that they'll like you first and maybe then they can like Jesus. I'm not saying we need to be rude, brash, arrogant, blunt, or anything like that. I am just saying, look, if you feel like you need to hide your faith until the time is right, you're manipulating the message. I'm not saying you need to go into your workplace guns blazing, you know, uh, shouting at the top of your lungs, everybody needs to repent today and be saved. I'm not saying that's the correct approach. I am saying that if you feel like you need to cover Jesus up in your life so that people like you better, you're manipulating the message. Trust the message, okay? Not everybody's going to like it, um, but some people are going to come to faith because you trusted the gospel to be powerful enough to open blind eyes and to give life to the dead. I invite you, trust the message. Let's not hide who we are. Let's not hide the one we believe in. Let's make an open statement of the truth. Jesus is Lord. He died, he rose again, so that people who repent and believe can be saved. Trust the message. We don't need to do it. Manipulation won't build a church. Manipulation won't build your faith. Manipulation definitely won't bring other people to Christ. Only Christ can do that. So let's get him out there and let's tell people about him. And if you don't know him, we invite you. Turn away from your sin and receive Jesus Christ. He invites you to come. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this warning. And Lord, I pray that we would not be guilty of using the techniques of manipulation, but that we would trust your gospel, trust you to do the work, and let us simply be the servants who help other people see Christ. It's in your name we pray. Amen.